Don't say things you can't live up to, Grim. The flight from Coven to Mom's old shack took only an hour. It also helped that we didn't run into any Enclave patrols as we flew. Either Dad was able to keep the soldiers that normally kept an eye on the skies from doing anything about the sky carriage, or something else was going on up in the clouds. Either way, not long after we left that small town with the dragon statue in front of it, we were setting down in front of the same shack I'd seen in Stardust Memories. Your mom lived in this dump? Bite asked as we stepped out of the sky carriage. For a little while, yeah. I said as we all started heading towards the small building that looked ready to collapse. It looks like I'd fall over if you blew on it. Aura commented as she poked at the weathered wooden door. Wingnut examined it a little closer. Eh, nope. It's just meant to look unsafe. You can see that the walls and supports are in really good shape. I think some pony just wanted to make sure no pony tried to get in. From all the memory orbs I've gone through, I suppose it's the place that the Children of the Night first used as a bunker. I said, walking over to the door and turning the handle. It was locked. She tells me to head to this place and forgets to leave it unlocked. Good thing locks don't normally stop you from getting into most places. Aura teased. True enough. I've yet to meet a lock that I can't pick. But knowing Mom, it's pretty littered with traps or something else making it impossible to get into easily. I said. Like what? Stardust asked once he was able to unhook from the sky carriage. I'm not sure, but I'll see if I can at least pick the lock. I pulled out one of my last bobby pins and started to work on the lock. I was just feeling the tumblers inside the lock when the bobby pin started to glow red hot in my magic. I dropped it and watched the bobby pin melt onto the ground. Okay, that's a new one. If you can't pick the lock, then how are we supposed to get in? Stardust asked. I was just thinking about that when I stepped away from the door. Then, Bite pulled her gravity gun off her back, pointed it at the door, and smiled. How about we try this? She fired. A blast slammed into the old wooden door and turned into splinters. See? Wasn't that hard? Damn, kid, how'd you know that would work? Stardust asked. She shrugged and holstered her rifle again. Unicorns always seem to think they're smart when it comes to putting spells and things. I'm sure Shadow's mom put spells on it to keep ponies from picking the lock, maybe even protecting the door from being shot by plasma rifles or magical energy rifles. She could have even made sure that energy weapons like Aura's spear couldn't do anything. But my gravity gun fires gravitational pulsations from a small generator inside. I'm the first pony that I know of to make such a gun, so I figured I'd see if it worked. I just smiled a little and shook my head. So, in other words, you improvised to see what would happen? Duh! Bite said as she walked past the splintering remains of the door. I also like to prove to unicorns. Can't think of everything. I'm glad to see she's back to her normal self, Wind Thrasher said as she followed Bite. Yeah, I said, but I knew that Bite was just putting on a brave face, like I was. I had gotten close to Tonto during the three days we spent in Crimson Canyon. Same for Wingnut. What most ponies saw as Bite being normal herself, the bitchy, smug young mare was just a mask to hide the scared feeling that she was alone. She was just like me in that way. But instead of being depressed for eight years when my mom left me in Stable 28, Bite acted like nothing bothered her and made sure ponies were scared as hell of her. I saw some of the real bite starting to show herself when we were in Crimson Canyon. Now she'd reverted back into the filly I met in the shitty bar just outside of Trotston. I followed Wind Thrasher with Aura, Wingnut, and Stardust close behind. The shack was a single bed that was rotting in the corner, a rusty icebox, several broken shelves, and a desk lying on its side missing one leg. Nothing else that could be seen to lead us to an old pre-war bunker that could have been used by Night Stalker and the children long ago. Are you sure this is the right place? Aura asked as she scanned the small room. As sure as I can be, I replied. 
Everyone look around. See if you can find anything. Find what? This place is almost too small for all of us to fit in, let alone hide anything. Bite said, rolling her eyes. Right. Because the door wasn't magically reinforced or anything. Why would any pony hide anything behind such an enchanted door? I said sarcastically. In all seriousness, though, I don't know where to start. Just look for something that seems out of place. I continued as I started to look around. Aura, Stardust, and Windthrasher doing the same. Stardust bumped into Wingnut. Hey kid, are you going to help us look or not? A colt was studying the room. He didn't even seem to notice Stardust bumping into him or even seem to hear him. Not until Tardust used a wing to poke Wingnut. The colt seemed to come out of his deep thoughts and look up at Stardust. What? Are you just going to sit there all day daydreaming or help us find this entrance? Stardust asked, pushing past Wingnut and looking under the bed. I am helping, Wingnut said, going back to his thoughts for a moment. Then he got to his hooves. I'll be right back. Where's he going? Bite asked as she pushed the desk out of the way to check the floor beneath. Just leave him be. Keep searching, I said. I think we've looked everywhere at least twice, Nora commented. And this place isn't big. You're right, Tora. Wingnut said, coming back in through the shattered door. It is too small, he said suspiciously. Bite rolled her eyes again. Well, duh, that's what we've been saying. No, I mean it's bigger on the outside, he argued. I walked over to him. What do you mean? Follow me, Wingnut said, trotting back out of the shack. I looked at the small building. Okay, so it's a small shitty shack, so what? Yeah, it's small. But think about the size of the inside of it when you're looking at the walls out here. I'm not seeing a difference, Wingnut. I said, confused. It may look smaller in size, but if you look closer, you'll see that there's more of a difference than there should be for a shack size. The walls aren't thick enough to make the inside so compact compared to the outside, he said, looking smug. Okay, kiddo, so what does that mean and how does it help us? His answer took the form of him walking back inside the shack, pushing past Stardust, Bite, and a pissed-off-looking aura, just so he could stand in the middle of the room. He started looking around again, first looking at the wall in front of him with a single dirt-crusted window, then toward the left wall, then the right. Finally, he smiled. Clever. What's clever? Windthrasher asked. Wingnut grind grinned wider. The right wall is closer to the middle of the shack than the left wall. The window looks like it's right in the center of the far wall, so it's hard to tell. But if you count the boards from the window to the left, to the right, back and forth, you can see that the right side has one and a half less boards. He got up and walked to the right wall, then started to tap on it. The knocks made a hollow sound as he did. There's something behind here. Even if there is, that's not a big enough space to put an entrance to a bunker, Aura said. True, but that doesn't mean it's the entrance. Just a way to find the entrance, he said, starting to slowly work his way down the wall then stopped at one spot. I think I found it, he said as he pushed his hoof on a big knot in the wood. Something clicked, then the wall was sucked into the floor. Behind it was the true wall to the shack, and a single small terminal bolted into the wall. I couldn't help grinning embarrassingly, with a hoof behind my head for doubting our young genius colt. What will you do without you, kid? He just shrugged. You'd look around this shack for a few hours, and you'd throw a hissy fit. Stardust would start shooting things, Wind Thrasher would try to make you two stop, or I would just leave you while you acted like the foals. And I'm sure Bite would be sitting in one corner laughing her ass off. The filly grinned. That does sound like me. I just shook my head and walked over to the terminal. Honestly, you hit the nail on the head. He did not. Stardust sulked in a quieter voice. 
I'd kick a few things first before I started shooting. Ammo's expensive. I ignored my friend as I went to the already unlocked terminal. There was only one option. Access COTN Bunker. So I clicked it, figuring there had to be more to this than opening up the bunker. Sure enough, the voice echoed out of the terminal. Please provide the passphrases. Great. So now there's a passphrase, Aura said. If this bunker was anything like the base the children had in Canterlot, then it might be the same. So, digging into my own memories, I remembered the phrase recited by Night Stalker. By the night's glory, I request passage into the home of the children who took to the night sky for protection. What kind of passphrase is that? Bite asked. Then her eyes went wide as the terminal spoke again. Captain Night Stalker's personal passphrase accepted. Welcome home, Captain. Yes, I said happily. The wall slid back into place, and the floor under us shook as a section of the floor opened to reveal a large metal platform, just big enough for us all to squeeze onto. Looks like we found our way in, I said, walking over to the metal platform. Are you all ready? Wingnut nodded and joined me, still looking proud of himself. Bite, who was still shocked, followed after. Stardust just chuckled to himself, joining us on the platform with Wind Thrasher following closely behind. Aura sighed and smiled. What the hell? We've gotten this far. Might as well see what your mother was hiding down there. The platform shook as soon as all of us were on it, and it plummeted down. Our ride was fast. Using my best judgment, I'd say that we were quite a ways underground. The perfect hiding place for the children of the night when they first came to New Pegasus. Also, a good place to hide out and work on research for a mare who had nowhere else to go. The lift stopped at a small, decrepit hallway being eaten by 200 years of rust and calcite buildup that had a single door at one end. As soon as we all got off the lift, it shot back up towards the shack. Cautiously, we all walked towards the door at the end of the hallway. This was the children of the night's old bunker, and who knows how active the traps would be, if any. I took hold of the simple doorknob of my magic and said, Be ready for anything. My friends all readied their weapons as I pulled Dreamwalker out of my holster. Opening the door, we found ourselves... confused. At the very least, I know I was confused, because I thought this place would be a uh, run-down, judging by the rustic hallway, or like walking into an old stable. But no, this room was clean. Not a hint of dust or rust or anything that would tell me that this place had been abandoned for 200 years before Mom found it. I... Don't think that I've ever seen a place this clean. Ever, Stardust said. And I grew up in a stable. Thanks, Captain Obvious, I said nonchalantly, looking around at the polished floors, metal walls, and clear glass that looked into a small lab. I noticed the polished wood doors all had names on them. They started just past the lab and wrapped around the level we were on. A big gap in the middle of the floor opening into a room below, just like the upper floor of an atrium in a stable. Well, most stables, at least, we entered on the upper floor. The one at my left read, Thunder Lane. The one on my right, Red Manette. I started to walk slowly around the upper levels, letting my eyes wander over the names of each pony that used to be part of the Children of the Night. Thunder Lane, Bad Seed, Cloudy Nights, Comet Tail, Night Stalker, Greta, Lightning Dust, Amethyst Star, and Minette. The only name missing was Phoenix Heart, since she had died before they came out west. Aura was following me as I walked. She finally asked me as I looked up at the name of my great-great-great-great-grandmother. You okay, Shadow? It's just so strange to be in this place. The place where it all started where the children started working on Stargazer, where they lived before they built the Lucky Horseshoe? Windthrasher asked me, Do you want to go in? I looked up at Manette's name for a long moment before shaking my head. No, we have enough to do right now. I need to look at the memory orb so I know what Mom wanted me to come here for. Let's go to the lower level first before you go off into an orb. 
Horus said, leading the way that we all headed down the stairs, then stopping on the last stair as we saw what Mom did down here. Or at least I assumed it was her, because across the way from where we stood on the steps I could see memory orbs on the shelf in the back. The lower chamber was ten times the size of the upper. A few rooms split off from this one, and a strange machine with two pods was sitting next to the orbs itself. Every single orb was hovering in a small light, with a protective sheet of glass on the face of the shelf to keep any pony from taking the orbs. The shelf had ten rows to hold memory orbs, five on each row. The first seven rows were filled, but only three orbs were left on the eighth row, leaving the rest empty. To make this place even more impressive were the wires flowing from each shelf that all led to the two pods in one corner of the room. Along another wall there were a few terminals. A cot was set up near that, and some old snack cake wrappers were thrown everywhere, with a stack of sparkle cola bottles next to another wall, and some clothes and armor. It looked like some pony had left here in a hurry a little while ago, maybe months ago. But if that was true, then why was this place so clean from the top level, but so dirty down here? I got my answer when I made a final step down to the floor and tripped on the legs of a robot. Clumsy filly, I scolded myself. Regaining my composure, only to lose it as fast as I gained it, I almost screamed until I saw the broken remains of a white robot that looked like Watts, or one of the lucky horseshoes. Wingnut and Bite both jumped down after me, the former saying, That looks like a Gen 3 nanny bot. Some pony put a number on it. She was right. The robot looked like it had taken a few shots from a magical energy rifle, so I walked past it. Apart from the Miss Nanny, it doesn't look like anything's dangerous around here. The rest of my friends joined us, looking around the larger room. There were a few more doors to the right, and metal door with a window on the left. Or I walked over to it. it. Looks like this was a cell. At least it's empty. Stardust and Windthrasher both checked the other rooms as I walked towards the pods. Stardust came out of the other room quickly, saying... It doesn't look like any pony's been in here for a few months. Maybe a year. As I looked closer at the pods, I asked, Did you find anything interesting? Stardust joined me. Nope, just a bathroom. But the water is running still, and it's clean, so that's something nice at least. I guess, Windthrasher said, coming back out of the door she'd been checking. Nothing here but a few scrap parts and some old food and sparkle cola. Aura chuckled. I hoped you grabbed it all. I looked over at Windthrasher right as she blushed a little. I can't. I mean, I grabbed as much as I could, but there's at least eight more crates of it in there. We'll see what we can get later. Right now, I think we should check out the memory orb to see what Mom wanted me to do here. I said as I walked towards the cot. Are you all going to be okay while I'm in the orb? Stardust shrugged. We should be fine. I'm thinking about going back up and hiding the sky carriage, just in case we're here for a little while. Good idea, Hora said. I'll come help you. I'm sure Shadow will be fine with Wind Thrasher in the foals. Wingnut and Bite were already pulling parts off the Miss Nanny, but Bite looked up at Aura. I'm not a foal, okay? Foal, shrimp number three, whatever. You're still small, Aura said, following Stardust as he walked up to the stairs. Okay, I guess I'll see you two later, I said, lying on the cot. As I pulled the orb out, Wingnut looked over at Windthrasher, who was sitting at the end of the cot, asking, Windthrasher, do you see any extra parts for this Miss Nanny? Maybe. I'm not sure what I'd be looking for, Windthrasher said, heading back towards the room. I just touched my horn to the orb. Unlike the orb of Night Stalkers, where it asked for his name, this one didn't say anything. Instead, a pressure started to build on my horn, and I started to find it hard to breathe. It took everything I had to say, Nightshade. The pressure vanished, and the world melted away.
Right away, I found myself in Mom's body. She was in the same room I was, only it was less messy. She was sitting on the cot, looking down at an old photo of me, taken on my last birthday I had when I was still in the Crystal Empire. In the photo, you could see how sick I was. My body was thin, dark shadows were under my eyes, and even my smile looked forced. I felt tears in Mom's eyes as she slowly ran a hoof over the old photo, a single tear landing on the edge. You were such a brave filly, even back then, my little star, Mom said. It was like she was talking only to me, as if I was sitting right next to her. Do you remember when this was taken? One week before we left our home, so I could find you a cure? I wanted so badly to hold on to her and say, I remember, Mom. She sniffed, then a hurt laugh came out of her as she tried to hold back a sob. Four years old, sicker than a filly your age should have had to deal with, and you still wanted your father and me to throw you a party. We invited that colt from next door that always dropped by to see you. I forget his name, but he was such a nice colt. His name was Razorwing. He was a year older than me, but always kind to me. I said, even though she couldn't hear me. Mom wiped her eyes. Razorwing, that it was. I just remembered. His mother worked the lab with me. I think this was one of my last good memories of our home, even though you had a bad attack that night when you were sitting with your father in his study. I remember that, too. It was the same memory I'd had when I was in the Bramble. Dad was letting me sit with him talking to me about using my magic without Mom's help when my heart nearly stopped. If Mom hadn't been in the other room, I could have died. It was that day that she decided she had to take me to New Pegasus so she could find the project to help cure my illness. Mom put the picture away, then got to her hooves and walked down towards a mirrored setup in one corner of the room we were in. I could see how much older she looked compared to when she left the stable. This memory orb had to be around the same time she'd lost her memories. Her mane was longer than it was now, pulled back into a messy ponytail. Her dark gray eyes were sunken in and dark as if she'd lost all hope. Without the cloak and armor she wore normally, I could see that she had scars all over her chest and forelegs. She was also wearing a pit buck that had a small 97 on it. She must have started using stardusts after she took it off of him. She looked up into the mirror. I didn't know what happened, but all of a sudden I saw myself in the mirror, and my mom to the side of me, saying, Sweetie, if you're watching this memory orb, that means that something's happened to me. First, I wanted to say that I'm sorry that I've had you following the small clues I've been leaving for you. But I couldn't risk the information I've found getting into the wrong hooves. It's been seven years and six months since I last saw you, and I made a lot of enemies over the years. Some from before I left Stable 28, and a lot of them after. If you haven't run into the Steel Rangers yet, then please stay away from them. I've left notes for you on the Mark II telling you this, but I'm saying it again just in case you haven't unlocked all the files yet. Elder Appleslice will do anything to get her hooves on it. She sighed and then chuckled. Knowing my luck, their bunker is the first place you went looking for me. If my spell worked to help you remember when you first found the Mark II, that is. When we lived with the Steel Rangers, life was good. The Elder was kind and wise to both of us. I wish I could say the same for his daughter. Apple Slice isn't trustworthy, though I'm sure she'll try to make you think that she is. Just don't trust her. She's been working with another Elder. One that you've never met. One who will do anything to get the Mark II. The only good thing is that he doesn't know that the one he needs is the one that you have now. The other two are special, but nothing like yours. Just stay away if you can. If you're ready, run into them and help them to get a Mark II from either Stable 9 or Trotston, then I'm just glad you're okay. At least I hope you are if you ever get to see this orb. She sat down, looking away from the mirror, and then took a deep breath and looked back at herself. I'm saying all of this as if you were here, because I don't know any other way of explaining to you why I had to do all of this. And this is why, once I've made this memory orb into an orb, 
I'm going to give it to Tonto. He's the only Red Griffin I trust. I needed you to come here so that you can see the truth of why I am the way I am and who I am, how I got my power, why I came out here, and why I'm looking for falling shadows. She looked towards the rows of memory orbs. Those are all mine. I made every one of them over the years and brought them here and set them up to work with that machine. It's an invention of our grandmother, Minette. As far as I know, it's the only one she ever made. What it does, take memories of any orb put into the shelves and feeds them into those pods. She looked back at the mirror where I still saw myself next to her. I can see her eyes looking at to the side as if she was looking directly at me. I want you to get into one of those pods and watch them all. Understand that some of them will be hard to understand. They may show truths that you may not want to know about me. But you have to understand that is a risk, and why you need to finish what I started. Even though I don't want to make you do this, it has to be done. The memories will take a few days to watch. The pods will make sure your body is hydrated and fed so you'll be okay. Before you watch them, make sure you have a pony or two you can trust to keep an eye on you, though. Unlike most memory orbs, you can be pulled out of the pods in the middle of a memory. Don't go into the pods if you're alone. If you don't have any pony you can trust, then hire a Red Talon Griffin. Talk to Tonto, and he'll tell you who you can trust to watch your back. She sighed. I know something's about to happen. I'm just not sure what it is yet. But I just know that my time is coming to an end. Tears started to fall again as she looked back at her own reflection. My little star, you need to get Aquila out of you. If you don't... Just find a way, because I couldn't live with myself if I let that thing inside of you take over. I know you can never forgive me for letting my worry of you blind me to the danger of what was sleeping in that old lab. I just hope that you'll at least understand why I had to try to help you. I want you to know that I'm very sorry for everything I did. And remember that I love you with all of my heart, and I miss you every day. When you're better, try and find your father and go home. Be happy. Find somebody that loves you and have a happy life. Her crying stuttered her speech now as she looked and took a deep breath. I was hoping that I'd see you again one day, Shadow, my little star. But I know better now. That's my punishment for everything I put you through. Twelve years away from home, telling you Nightshade was dead, letting that horrible monster into you, and taking away your memories. I've been an awful mother, and all I can do is say that I'm sorry for it all. Goodbye, my little star. Remember that you are powerful, kind, and the best daughter a mother could ask for. Be brave, and never give up. Shine bright, brighter than any pony has before. She took in another deep breath and choked out. I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. The memory ended so quickly that I jumped when I came out of it. The memory orb onto the cot next to me as I breathed heavily. Windthrasher saw me jump up and ran over to me. Are you okay? I'm fine. Why? She used a wing to wipe a tear away from my cheek. You're crying. I looked down at the orb. It was a goodbye message from my mom. Aura and Stardust were just starting to come back down the stairs, I spoke. Aura saying, So she wanted you to come all the way here just to say goodbye? I wiped my eyes and shook my head. No. I pointed to the orbs in the pods. She wanted me to watch those. Those pods make it so that any pony can watch the memories. She said I have to see them to understand what she was doing and how I can finish what she started to get Aquila out of me. My friends looked over at the orbs, then at the pods. Then Stardust said, Yeah, right. Like you're going to just get into that thing. Those memories will take forever to watch. I got up off the cot. I'm doing it. Aura spoke up this time. Like hell you are, what if it's a trap? It's not. How do you know? Stardust interjected. 
I just know. That memory wasn't fake. Mom knew something was going to happen to her, so she wanted to make sure I'd know what to do. She knows that Aquila has to be stopped, so she wanted to make sure that I had the information I needed, I said as I walked towards the pods. Aura walked over to me and put a talon on my shoulder. Do we even have time for you to do this? I looked up into her beautiful icy blue eyes. I don't have time to wait. If this can help me free myself from Aquila, then I have to try. She sighed, then pulled me into a tight hug. Fine, but you aren't doing it alone. If there are two pods, then I'll watch them with you. I hugged her back, then pulled back. The pods are made for ponies. You won't fit. I'll do it, Windthrasher said. Aura, you can help Stardust keep an eye on us and keep this place safe. Maybe plan our next move? She sighed. Are you sure? When Thresher nodded. I won't be much help while she's in there anyway, so I might as well watch them with her. Stardust sighed, then shrugged. Fine, but I don't like it. What if something happens when you're in the middle of there? I pushed the button to open the pods, then looked back at them. Mom said there's a way to pull us out in case of an emergency. If something happens, then pulls us out. Byte trotted over to the small terminal next to the pods, looking over the files on it. <laughs> Fool's play. I can monitor them from here. Okay. I guess we don't get a choice. Plus, we should lay low for a little while anyway while things settle and the unchained talons. Aura said as I got into one pod, Wind Thrasher in the one next to me. I'll be back as soon as I can. I love you. I said, leaning up to kiss her. She smiled. Just be careful. Wind Thrasher chuckled. Isn't she always? That's what worries us. Stardust said with a laugh. Good luck, you two. I smiled, then closed the pods. Once they were shut, I heard Bite saying from a speaker next to my head. Okay, I'm starting up the program. Be ready. In three... Two. One. Everything went dark and the world melted away. I found myself in a Philly version of my mom. She was walking down one of the roads in the Crystal Empire near the large castle where a bright white light was shooting up towards the sky. A barrier emanating from it to protect the town from the black cloud of death. She was holding on to a single pencil concentrating with everything she had to keep it floating in front of her. Her mind was so lost in her small task that she didn't even notice the other foals walking the other way until she bumped right into them. She fell back, dropping the pencil. She shook her head, saying, Hey, watch where you're going. She looked up and her ears fell back as she saw Philly around her age, another unicorn with a red coat and a bright green mane. Two pegasi colts on each side of her, and a dark gray unicorn with orange eyes behind them. The Philly mom ran back into looking disgusted as her eyes fell on mom. Oh, goddesses, you touched me. Gross. Mom's eyes fell as she muttered, Sorry, I didn't see you, Scarlet. What are you even doing this close to the old castle spell? I thought that your family lived near the wall, the red unicorn filly said. Mom got back to her hooves. I... I was meeting my brother. The filly rolled her eyes. Ari, why would he even bother with a weak spellcaster like you anyway? Even if you are his sister, you're just a pathetic unicorn. They should have just cut your horn off and put you to work with their pony stuff. Now get out of here before I tell the guards you're trying to steal stuff. Mom glared up at Scarlet. I can go wherever I want. The two colts laughed, one saying, Look, Scarlet, she thinks she's tough. The dark gray filly put a hoof on Scarlet's shoulder. Maybe we should just leave her alone, Scarlet. We have class soon. Scarlet looked back at her. Keep quiet, Stormy. 
This pathetic excuse for a unicorn needs to learn her place. I couldn't tell that Mom was getting mad at her, her horn starting to strain as she pulled out her magic. Shut up, Scarlet, or I'll... I'll... Scarlet just started to laugh. Oh, look, she's trying to cast a spell. <laughs> what are you going to do? Let your horn glow at me? I'm so scared. I'll... Mom tried to say, but her voice was weak and she started to shake. Move, Scarlet said, her own horn glowing as she shot a spell at Mom, throwing her to the side and onto the steps leading to the Crystal Castle. The two colts and Scarlet started to laugh as they walked off. The dark gray filly, however, walked over to Mom. Here, let me help you, Spell. Mom was doing her best to keep from crying as she took Stormy's hoof. Thank you, Stormy. I don't know why she has to be so mean to me. She's a bitch. She excelled early with her magic, and she thinks that makes her special. As the filly helped Mom up, I realized I knew the young gray mare. It was a young Dr. Stormy. Why do you hang out with her, then? You're nothing like her, and you're way smarter, too. Mom said as she tried and failed to pick up her saddlebags. I'll never get the hang of this. Stormy used her own magic to help Mom. You will one day, Spell. Trust me. You're a smart filly just like me. You just need to find your own power, and one day you'll show up, Scarlet. You really think so? Mom asked shyly. I do, Stormy said as she looked towards where her friends went. I have to get to class. You want to meet me at the malt shop later? Maybe. Or he wants to help me with my magic later when he's done with the class. But I'll see if I can make it. That is, if Mom or Dad don't try to make me come home early. I'll be there for a while, studying. Bring Ori with you if you'd like. He's always welcome. Mom smiled a little. You only say that because you like him. Stormy made a gagging sound. Ew, no. He's just nice, that's all. Anyway, I'll see you later then, okay? Sure. Mom said as Stormy ran off. Mom sighed, kicking the pencil away, then looked up at the old castle. Find my power. As if I'm just like Mom and Dad. Useless for a unicorn. She started walking up the steps and towards the doors that led into the castle. Guards on both sides of them keeping ponies out, but she wasn't trying to get in. She started looking around. Where are you, Ori? You said you'd be right at noon, and it's way past noon. She sighed, then started walking towards the wall so she could sit and wait. As she did, she looked at those doors again. A zap went through her horn. She jumped, then looked around. What was that? As she looked towards the doors again, her horn zapped again. She walked closer. What's going on? When she was a few inches away from the doors, one of the guards... A pegasus in power armor said. That's close enough, young filly. No ponies allowed inside. Mom looked up at him and backed away. I'm sorry. I just felt something strange and I wanted to see what it was. The other guard looked over at her, saying, Hey, aren't you fallen stars, kid? Go back to your rundown shanty before we call the city guard. Your kind isn't welcome here. I felt Mom getting angry again as she said, Bite me. You better watch your tone, unicorn. Your family's already close to being kicked out of the Enclave as it is. Don't make it worse. Mom backed away, looking down at her hooves. Sorry, sir. I don't know what came over me. That's better, he said. Worthless unicorn. As he spoke, two stallions started to fight a few inches away just at the bottom of the steps. The other guard cursed. Damn it. Why can't ponies drink and fight when it's later so I don't have to deal with them? They started to head down towards the two fighting stallions, but the first guard looked back at Mom. You better not be here when we get back. Okay, sir. Mom said, watching them fly off to break up the fight. Then she looked back at the doors and smiled. Okay. If you don't want me here when you get back, then I won't be. 
she pushed the doors of the castle open and slipped inside. She looked around, quickly trying to figure out where the strange feeling in her horn was coming from. Just in the entryway, a long hallway led towards a set of double doors that must have led to a throne room. The feeling in her horn, however, pulled her to the right and down a small hallway. So Mom followed it. She walked around the mostly empty castle, not running into any ponies as she trotted. The sparking in her horn led her down some stairs, then more hallways, dark places where like no pony had been in a long time. Finally, she found herself next to a large glass door that led into a beautiful garden. She pushed open the doors and walked out into the courtyard, when the feeling went away. She stopped, then looked back at a statue of Luna. Why is a statue of the goddess of the night stuck at the end of the hallway? She said, and I agreed. You could barely see the beautiful statue in the darkness, just past the garden's doors. Mom walked over to it and looked it over. Then she noticed a small engraving on the bottom corner of the statue, right at the base near Luna's hoof. She wiped away some dust, then read the small words. Luna is our mother, the mother of the night. We, her children, live to protect Equestria from the shadows. We serve in darkness to protect the light. Huh, that's strange. Why would any pony etch that here? Something in the statue beeped and Mom backed away as the eyes of Luna's statue lit up and a flash of blue light rolled over her. Then the statue came to life and stepped out of the way. It's as if a small voice seemed to whisper, Welcome to the children of the night. Just behind where the statue had been, a door seemed to appear out of nowhere. For a long moment, Mom just looked at it, her hooves shaking. That is, until she heard a voice from down the hall. I'm sure she came in here. That brat used that fight to sneak in, and if the captain finds out that we let some filly in here, we'll both lose our jobs. Oh no, Mom said, and she ran to the door, opened it, and ran through. As soon as the door closed... She she could hear the statue stepping back into place to cover the door. Mom looked back at it and started to shake when she realized she was trapped in the dark hallway. After taking a few breaths, she calmed down and started heading down the hall, her horn still sparking now and then, until she came to a single oak wood door. As soon as she stepped in front of it, the feeling in her horn stopped again. She looked around, back down the hall, to the walls on each side of her, but the feeling never came back. She lifted a hoof and opened the door. Beyond was an enormous room. Not just a room, but a library. I wondered to myself, as Mom trot forwards, if this place was Uncle Oricalus called the Forgotten Library. As Mom walked, small lights came to life as she started to look through the books on one of the shelves. Each one was some kind of spell book, from simple beginner's books to advanced ones. Another shelf held thick books of history, Another, with books on robotics and so on. This place is amazing, Mom said, jumping with joy as she started walking around the library. Her eyes scanned the titles of each book. The room had to be old. Not a single scrap of dust could be seen. Mom went around one of the shelves and stopped. At the end of the row of books was a table, with a massive tome lying open at the desk. Around the table were two skeletons, one in Pegasus armor, the other was a unicorn in an enclave officer's uniform. When she walked closer, she saw dried blood on the simple blue carpet. Mom started to shake as she walked closer, saying, Hello? Is any pony in here? No pony answered. So she walked even closer to the skeletons and looked to where the blood went to. There was blood everywhere, dried onto the table, the books around it, and the floor. But further down the way, bloody prints from what could be talons led towards a solid wall of books. As if a drag mark, as if a griffin had come and dragged a body with it. Whatever happened here happened a long time ago, Mom said, taking in a deep breath and looking back at the book on the table. Then at a single statuette sitting next to it. A statuette that I now had in my own saddlebags. Twilight Sparkle. Mom's eyes went wide and she picked the statue up, ignoring the death and gore around her. Twilight Sparkle, the best magical pony in Equestria, 
Who would leave such beautiful statuette like you down here? Mom said as she looked it over. I'm going to take you with me and get you out of this place. She concentrated with all of her magic and used it to slowly take hold of the statuette so she could use her hooves to open her saddlebags. Mom's eyes went wide as she felt something happen. Her magic, which was barely able to hold onto the statuette, before got a little stronger, and it was like something clicked inside of her head. She looked at the statuette for a long moment, then smiled. I don't know what you are, but I'm never letting you out of my sight. She put the statuette away, then looked down at the book. It was open to a page explaining how advanced teleportation worked and how to use it without drawing on too much power. Mom used her magic to close the book and saw nothing written on the cover, so she opened it to the first page. Still nothing apart from a table of contents. So Mom looked at the last page of the book and her heart started racing again. Property of Minette. The same spell book that I now carried. Minette. So this library has to be one of our great-grandfather spoke of. The library where you kept all your secrets. He said his location was lost when you disappeared. It's a forgotten library, one with spells that no pony has seen in a long, long time. Mom said with her smile growing. Maybe I can learn from these. And no pony will say I'm a weak unicorn again. The memory faded only to be replaced by another. This time, Mom was older. Probably closer to my age now. She was just outside a small school building next to the Crystal Palace, talking with a young, handsome gold pony with bright purple eyes. A purple six-pointed star encircled his zebra glyphs. He was a young Orichalis. Grim, I don't understand why you're so worried. I've made a lot of progress in your spell work over the years, my uncle said, giving me a smile. Mom rolled her eyes. I know, Ori, but I know I can do more. What do you need to do more? You're already top of your class. You've shown up that bitch Scarlet in a dozen ways now. Isn't it enough to know that you've surpassed every pony's expectations? He asked. No, it's not. Not if I ever want to get into the research department in Nimbus, Mom said. Ori Callis chuckled a little to himself as he sat down next to Mom. Grim, I think you're thinking a little too far ahead. You still have two more years of school left. Just try and enjoy life a little and stop trying to push yourself so much. She sighed and leaned against her brother. I know, but I just feel like I'm wasting my time in my classes when I already know it all. I mean, I've learned more from the books in the Forgotten Library than I ever did in school. He pulled her closer, giving her a hug. Listen, sis. Even I had to wait until I was done with school before I even started looking into getting a job in the Enclave. Just relax and be a normal teenager for once. Mom's eyes fell as she said, The sooner I get out of school, the sooner I can get away from home. I felt Ori Callis soften a little. Mom's still giving you a hard time. Mom, Dad, both of them are a nightmare to live with. You're lucky you got out when you did. I wish I could live with you instead. I know. But you know that you can't go up to Nimbus until you have a job up there. Mom sighed again. Stupid laws. I don't know why the Enclave can't just see unicorns as equals. Same here. Mom looked up at her brother. Is there anything you can do so that I can move up there with you? He moved a hoof up to rub his mane. I wish that there was, but even if I could, I'm not home much. I'm always working on some new spell to help the military. Even if I could get the city council to allow it, my commander wouldn't. A few tears formed in Mom's eyes as she said, I just want to get away from Dad. Both of them, if I can. No matter how good I am at magic, they still don't seem to care. Dad's a bastard, and Mom just... Stuck her own world of big dreams off having a bigger life. You know I may have an idea on how I get you away from them, he said. Mom pulled away, looking back at him. How? He smiled. Remember that idea you had about how you could make your own magic more powerful using less energy? She nodded. Yeah, 
mixing my own magic with the glyphs of the zebras together. Why do you ask? He smiled wider. My commander's son works with the research department at Nimbus. If you can make that idea work, I'll see if I can set up a meeting with the department heads and see about getting you in. Mom jumped to her hooves. Really? You do that for me? The smile on my uncle's young face was wonderful to see, as he said. Of course. I would do anything for you. She hugged him tight as the memory orb started to fade. Thank you, Ori. The next memory started with Mom sitting at a malt shop, with Stormy saying, So, you really have a meeting with the three department heads from Nimbus? Mom took a sip of her malt. Yeah. Ori talked with his commander, who talked to his son. His son is, I guess, has some pull with the department heads, and they set up the meeting. Stormy smiled at Mom, leaning her head on a hoof as she said, I'm so jealous. I'd love a chance like that. Mom chuckled to herself. Oh, I plan on getting you in too, Stormy. Remember, we always said we'd do this together. Best friends forever. I wasn't sure if Mom could see it, but the way Stormy was looking at her, it was the same way I looked at Aura sometimes, or how I caught Wind Thrasher looking at Stardust when he wasn't looking. Stormy seemed to catch herself as she lifted her head again. Always grim. But how am I going to get in? I don't have anything as good as you to do to show them. You have that idea on magical gene manipulation, Mom said. I do, but it's only a theory right now, and one I'm not sure will work. Mom smiled and leaned closer to her, saying quietly, Ponies have been saying the same thing about mixing zebra magic with pony magic for years, and I'm going to prove them wrong. True, but I haven't seen you make it work either. Mom looked around, making sure no pony was watching, when she said, Watch this. Mom took Stormy's malt and placed it in the center of her table. Her horn started to glow, and being inside of her body, I could tell she was doing something very different than what most unicorns did to cast a spell. On the table, just under the malt, a circle with glyphs in it showed up, glowing blue. Then the entire malt turned into stone. Stormy's jaw dropped, open, as Mom beamed. How did you do that? You shouldn't have been able to transfigure something like that into stone. Even if you could, the amount of energy it would cost would leave you panting and weak. Mom shook her head, saying, Using the magic circle, I don't have to use hardly any of my magic. All I have to do is form the circle, then a little more to make sure that what I want is put into the spell, and the circle does the rest. The power to cast the spell is pulled from the energy created by the shifting of the tectonic plates deep in Equus's crust. Can you teach me to do that? Stormy said, still looking at the rock that was shaped like her drink. And maybe get me another malt? Mom just laughed. I could, but it would take a lot of time. You have to learn everything about the zebra language and understand how they use their magic. And here I thought zebras didn't have magic. They don't. They use magic from other sources. Normally gems and stuff like that. This kind of magic is the hardest for them to do. It takes a lot of time to form the magic circles. I just found a way to do it a lot quicker. Mom said as the memory faded away. The next memory started with Mom in the middle of explaining the same thing she'd shown Stormy at the malt shop to two unicorns and a pegasus sitting at a desk. So you see, with this, I can take magic that is thought to be impossible or takes too much energy to perform, and make it a hundred times easier. A unicorn mare, who looked as old as box tape, looked at Mom as if she was a bug. That's an interesting fairy grimoire spell, but that's all it is. You aren't the first pony to come up with this idea and fail at performing it. Another unicorn, a stallion, yawned, saying, Oh, I thought you had something worth showing us, Miss Bell. I didn't come all the way down here to waste my time. You may show yourself out. Mom stomped a hoof, saying quickly, It's not a theory. I can do it. I'm sure you think you can. But as I said, this magic isn't possible. The unicorn mare said. I can prove it to you. Mom said, her ears drooping a little. Miss Bell, the stallion said. 
I'm not going to waste any more of my time watching you put on an illusion to make us think your so-called theory is impossible. Now leave. The Pegasus Stallion put up a hoof. No. I'd like to see Grimoire. You said this power can make spells easier to do, am I right? Mom looked over at the Pegasus, then nodded. Yes, sir. The unicorn mare rolled her eyes. Light fog, don't listen to her. She's just the youngest daughter of farm ponies at the outer edge of the Crystal Empire. Her family hasn't been good at magic for over a hundred years. The Pegasus looked over at her. From what I've read, your brother is a gifted unicorn. So why can't she be the same? Also, she's top of the class, passed all the exams, finished school early, been able to show up most of the unicorns two years over her, and seems to think she was able to figure out a theory no unicorn has been able to make work. We came all the way here from Nimbus to see what she can do. It's the least we can do to let her demonstrate. And if you remember my own family coming from the slums of Nimbus, you should still... Took me all those years ago. Fine, but make it quick. And if she really thinks she can do this, then I want her to prove it by doing something no unicorn with using most of their energy could do. The mayor said. Mom looked between them all. Like what? The unicorn stallion took a large diamond out of his bags and sat it into the table. Shatter this into the diamond dust, only using your magic, if you can. Even I knew that was something that a unicorn shouldn't try to do. Most gems hold spells well, diamond being one of the best. They can also reflect magic better than anything else in the world. To shatter one that big into dust would require her to put so much energy into it that the gem couldn't hold the power, then shatter into the dust without that pent-up magic recoiling back at her. Mom took the diamond with her magic and moved it to the center of the room. Do any of you have a blast box? You won't need one. I know that spell won't work. The mayor said. The pegasus defending her rolled his eyes and pulled out a small box, giving it to Mom. Here you go. Don't listen to those two. They just don't want to be shown up. Mom took it and placed the translucent box over the diamond. Mom then concentrated her magic. Again, I felt a strange way her magic moved through her horn as four magic circles appeared around the box. One under the gem, two on the side, and one on the top. Then, light started to fill the gem. It got brighter and brighter until Mom and the other ponies had to look away. A loud boom filled the room, followed by a flash of light so bright I could see it through Mom's eyelids. When Mom stopped the spell... She looked at a shimmering dust laying inside the box. Mom smiled, then looked back at the three ponies. See? Told you it worked. The unicorn's mare, draw, dropped open as she sputtered. How? How did you? The other unicorn finished what she was saying. How did you do that? It has to be a trick. There's no other way her theory worked. The unicorn mare said. The Pegasus just smiled. No trick, that. Well, Grimoire, thank you for the beautiful show. I think you are a very bright young mare, with a lot of great ideas and power from the looks of it. So, if my colleagues agree, I think we'd like to offer you a job. Mom's eyes went wide. You mean it? If the other two agree, then yes, he said. The mare was still looking at the dust. Yes, I don't know how you did that, but yes. The unicorn stallion just nodded, saying, I agree. Mom smiled wider. Thank you so much. I can't wait to move up to Nimbus. The Pegasus frowned. Well, you won't be moving up to Nimbus. Not yet, at least. But since you live so far from the skyport to get to Nimbus, we'll make sure you get lodging closer to town. Mom beamed, then asked, Um, would it be okay if I have a friend join me up there? The Pegasus seemed interested, so he asked, I don't see a problem with it, but normally we only let employees live in the housing we set up. 
Oh, trust me. My friend Stormy is just as smart as I am. And the more ideas that you find... Interesting. She's waiting for me outside if you want to meet her. The Pegasus smiled, and he looked at his still-shocked co-workers. Show her in. The memory shifted again. Only this time, Mom was back in the same living room I'd seen only once before in Oricalus's own memories. Her face hurt, same for her ribs, and it felt like she'd broken a leg or at least badly sprained it. One eye she couldn't see out of as she looked up with her good eye at an older stallion that looked so much like her brother. It was her father, and he was holding a hoof ready to hit her again. You ungrateful little shit! He yelled as he slammed a hoof down on her ribs again. We spent all that money to get you into that damned magic school, and this is how you repay us? I said you could never leave to get some job in Nimbus. Mom spat blood, then said quietly, I... I wanted to go. I want out of this house. Tough shit! Her father yelled, picking her up with his own magic and throwing her into a wall. Then he got in her face. You're my daughter. You work here on the farm to help us pay for the fucking food and shelter we've given you all these years. Your mother can't do the work anymore. We need you here. I could see a short unicorn sitting in one corner, watching. Quartz, she's too stupid to understand how much work we've put into her to make sure she has a home. He spat on Mom. Tell me about it. Tell me how did you trick those fools in Nimbus into thinking you had real power? What tricks did you pull to make them think you were worthy of working for them, huh? Not a trick. I'm just as powerful as Ori, Mom said quietly. He slammed her into the wall again. Don't pull that kind of shit. You're nothing but a weak, useless unicorn. You're lucky we didn't throw you out when you were a filly. We should have let you starve in the cold or made you walk through the black cloud. At least then we wouldn't have had to deal with your sorry ass for too long. Mom started to cry as pain ran up her back as he slammed her into the wall again, then threw her across the room. Her mother looked over at him, saying, Quartz, I think she's had enough. Shut up, fallen star. She has no idea what enough is. I tried and tried to make her understand that she is useless, but she still doesn't seem to understand. He said, walking closer to Mom, You don't know that you won't last two months on that job. Do you know what's going to happen when you get tossed out on your ass? You're going to have to work the streets. Maybe here in the Crystal Empire or in the Twin Cities, you'll have to sell your body just to eat. You're nothing more than a pathetic whore. Quartz, that's enough, her mother said. He didn't listen, getting even closer to Mom. Maybe that's how you got the job. Did you suck one of the ponies off so that he'd take pity on you? He ran a hoof slowly over her face. Is that what you did, you fucking whore? Fuck you, Mom said, trying to get up. Her father lifted her with his magic and slammed her face into the wall. Holding her there, then I felt her tail lift as her father got closer to her. Fuck me, huh? Is that what you want? He moved his muzzle an inch away from her ear, his body close to hers. Because I have no problem doing it. Daughter or no, you need to learn who's boss around here, just like your mother. Maybe once I make you my bitch, you'll figure that out. Mom was crying now as her mother yelled. Get off her, Quartz. One of his hooves moved away from Mom and a slap echoed through the room, followed by the sound of her mother crying and running from the room. Then his body was pressed against her as his breath rolled over her. A strong whiff of alcohol rolled over her as he breathed heavily. How about it, whore? Do you really want it, or are you going to be a good filly and do as you're told? Get off me, Mom said, her body shaking. Oh, what? He said as his hoof ran down her stomach, his magic still pinning her face to the wall, his hoof almost between her legs. Cry all you want. But the only way you're going to learn is if I show you who's... 
Mom's horn glowed as his hoof just ran too far. A magic circle appeared in the air and blasted him off. He slammed into the far wall and Mom tried to run. She got into the hall, almost running into her mother as Mom ran for her room, pain running up her foreleg. She dove for a dresser, picking up what looked like a portable radio. She just started to yell into it. Ori, help! Before the radio was ripped away from her and smashed against the wall, she turned around quickly, seeing her father at the door, blood running from her nose. You're going to pay for that bitch! How dare you attack me! Stay away from me, Mom said, backing against her wall, pain running through her broken leg as she tried to stand on it. Fuck that! When I'm done with you, you ungrateful whore, you're going to wish you were dead! He said as he started walking towards her. I said... Her horn glowed bright blue and ten magic circles appeared around her father. To stay away from me! Light flared in the room and her father started to scream. The circles started to glow brighter as her father screamed louder. For a moment I could see why. His coat was starting to bubble with blisters. They started to burst and form new blisters as his skin burned. His eyes turned red and blood started to flow from them along with his nose and mouth. His scream got higher as his eyes exploded. His coat burned away and the skin under it turned black. Then the screaming stopped as his body started to shrivel until it was half the size it had been a moment ago. The magic circles vanished and her father's corpse fell to the ground with a loud thud. A moment later her mother appeared in the door, her eyes falling on the husk that was her husband a moment ago. What did you do? Mom's eyes were just stuck on the body, as she said. He got what he deserved. You killed him, Spells. I'm getting the guards. Her mother said, turning to run away from her daughter, only to find Ori Callis standing there. My uncle looked at the husk that was once his father, then at Mom's broken and bruised body, then asked, What happened? Oh, Ori, thank goddesses you're here. Your psychopath of a sister killed Quartz. I'm getting the guard. Don't let her leave. Oricalis's horn glowed, and a moment later, her mother passed out. He walked in and pulled Mom close to him. Are you okay, sis? Mom started to cry. I just came home to get my things, and Dad freaked out. He... he attacked me. He... he tried to... tried to... Mom couldn't finish what she was saying. Hush. It's okay, Grim. I'll take care of this. Right now, we need to get you to a doctor. Can you walk? She kept on crying, but managed to say, I... I don't know. Don't worry. Let me take care of Mother's memory, then I'll get you to a safe place. Just try and calm down, okay? Mom nodded. I'll try. And that's my baby sis. Oricala said, walking over to her mother, his horn glowing as he performed a memory spell. Then he was back, slowly lifting Mom in his magic. Come on, let's get you out of here. The memory faded and another started up. I still couldn't believe my own grandfather was going to do to Mom. To make it worse, my grandmother just let it happen and blamed Mom for him dying. No wonder Mom never talked about them. Why I never met my grandmother or grandfather. They were monsters. One was dead, the other should be. The next memory started with Mom sitting on a cloud in a park in what could only be Nimbus. Stormy sitting next to her, both of them looking up at the blue sky. Stormy saying, So I hear that you and Stryker are getting pretty serious now. Mom chuckled. He's such a nice stallion. And yes, I think we are. But I told him I'm not going to stay the night with him until we're on at least ten dates. You've been seeing him for a year now? Haven't you gone out that many times by now? She asked. Yes, we have. But we don't ha get to go out much. Work keeps us both busy. Mom said as she yawned and rested her head on Stormy's shoulder. How are you doing with your mare friend? Stormy waved a hoof. She's more beauty than brains for my taste. She can't even tell the difference between rubidinium and cisium. 
Mom laughed again. I don't think most opponents can tell you even what those are. You could, Stormy said with a laugh. Maybe, but I'm smarter than most mares, Mom said. I thought you said she was really fun in bed. She is, but that's besides the point, Stormy said. I thought that's what's most important thing when you're looking for mares, Mom teased. Well, yeah, when I'm looking for a little fun, but not with a pony I want to be my mare friend. Now enough about me. Tell me, what's the next step with Stryker? Mom shrugged, still laying her head against her friend's shoulder. I don't know. I think he might be the one, but he has so many secrets. His whole family does. I heard his family's been all military since ever since the Enclave started. They have, but I'm not sure why that matters. His father's a dick. Trust me, my brother has to work with him. And don't get me started on his brother Nightshade. That stallion gives me the creeps. He's always staring at me when I see him with Stryker. Mom said, shivering. I don't know. I think Nightshade's kind of nice once you get to know him on his own. And when have you been alone with Nightshade? I thought you only liked mares. Stormy sighed. I do. And get your head out of the gutter, Grim. I got to know him when I spent those months at the training camp helping the military last year. Remember? Oh, yeah. I didn't know Nightshade was there, though. Yes, he was. He showed me around and talked to me a lot when he was on guard duty at the base, and I was working late. Did he say why he's always staring at me? Mom asked. We didn't talk about you. Mostly just about his family and how he always has to live up to his father's expectations. Maybe he's just jealous that you're with Stryker. He did just have a crush on you back in school, Stormy said. Yeah, I remember. He was also a dick back then, too. Stormy just laughed again, and for a while, they both just watched the sun start to set. Finally, Stormy asked, What if Stryker doesn't end up being the one? Mom looked up at her friend. What do you mean? What will you do if you end up not liking him as much as you thought you did? Stormy asked, her orange eyes still on the setting sun. I don't know. I guess I'll cry a little, hang out in your room for a few nights, eat too much ice cream, the usual. I'm serious, Grim. So am I, Mom said, getting back up and looking into her friend's eyes. Do you ever think you'd like to be with... You know, Stormy said, her voice trailing off as she looked away from Mom. Stormy, what's on your mind? Come on, you can tell me. I'm your best friend. I won't judge. Stormy moved forward and kissed Mom full on the lips. I felt Mom's body tense up as Stormy held the kiss for a long moment. Then she pulled away, blushing bright wed. I'm sorry, Grim. I don't know what came over me. Mom's eyes were as wide as her face, still as stuck in a state of shock. Where did that come from? Nowhere. I just got lost in the moment. I'll head back home. I'm sorry. And before Mom could say anything, Stormy teleported away. Mom just looked at the spot where her friend vanished for a long moment and cursed. She pulled on her own power and teleported as well. In a flash of blue light, Mom was at the skyport, Stormy not far off, looking to a pegasus about getting passage back to the Crystal Empire. Mom walked over to her, the clouds under her hooves soft and cool. Stormy, Mom said, tapping on her shoulder. Stormy jumped, then looked back at Mom, a blush on her face. Grim, why'd you follow me? Because you ran off before I could talk to you. Mom said. I know. I'm just so embarrassed that I didn't know what to say or what to do, so... So you teleported away. She nodded. I didn't mean to. Mom sighed and said to the Pegasus behind Stormy, Two tickets to the Cadence District in the Crystal Empire, please. Private carriage. And that'll be twenty bits, he said, looking back at Stormy, who was still standing there, blushing, then looked back at Mom. Mom pulled a pouch from her saddlebags and tossed twenty golden bits onto the counter. The pegasus behind them 
gave her two tickets, then told her where they could find their carriage. Stormy didn't say anything as Mom led her past the swarm of ponies to a small sky carriage with a single pegasus hooked up to it. Mom gave the stallion the tickets, then got back into the carriage, pulling Stormy with her. Once they were on their way, the sky carriage pushing under the clouds, Mom finally said, Stormy, you're my best friend. You know you can tell me anything, and you know that. I know, Stormy said, her eyes glued to the floor in the carriage. If you know, then why didn't you just tell me how you felt about me? She shrugged. I don't know. I guess I was just too scared to say something. Why on Equus would you ever be scared to tell me anything? Mom asked, putting a hoof on Stormy's. I didn't want you to hate me. Mom laughed. Stormy, I could have woken up with you in my bed and I still wouldn't have hated you. You're my best friend. But you like stallions. How could you not be angry for me, kissing you, or feeling the way that I do? Honestly, I was surprised how shy Stormy was around Mom. The Dr. Stormy I knew was nothing like this mare. What could have changed over the years to take her from this blushing, shy mare and make her turn into the snide mare who didn't have time to worry about any pony, like me putting a gun at her head? Then I felt bad, because I never knew Mom had a friend like her, and I killed her in cold blood just because she came up with the Devil's Children program. Mom sighed and then hugged her friend. I do like stallions, and yes, I may not be interested in a relationship with mares, but I still want you to be honest with me. Hold back your feelings isn't good for you, Stormy. So you're not mad? No, but just promise me that you won't surprise me with a kiss again. She blushed more, then nodded. I suppose I can do that. But what do I do about the way I feel? Mom took a moment to think, and then she smiled, asking, What's your preference when it comes to mares? Wings or horn? Why? Just answer the question, Mom said. I've always had a thing for pegasi. I mean, I like unicorns, or even earth pony mares too, but I just love the wings on a pegasus, she said, blushing a deeper shade of red. Mom's grin got bigger as she asked, Have you ever met my co-worker, Opal? During the flight back, Mom told Stormy all about the cute mare who worked in her office with her. By the time they got back to the apartment building they shared, Stormy was in a lot better mood, and she was laughing with Mom. As they walked up the steps to the apartment, Stormy asked, Oh, that's right. Remember when you asked me to find anything about Night Stalker? Yes. Well, after you told me what you learned from Stryker about those projects, I started digging in the old archives of the castle, and I found some interesting things that I think some pony was trying to hide, Stormy said as they got to their floor. Mom opened her mouth to ask what she found when she stopped, looking down the hall at the Pegasus sitting next to their apartment, blood covering his clothes, and anger written on his face. Mom moved down the hall, saying, Stryker, what happened to you? Get in the room he said, his tone harsh and hushed. Stryker, you're covered in blood, Mom said as Stormy came up behind her. She's right, Stryker. We need to get you to a doctor. He looked over at both of them. Get in the room! Not until you tell me what's going on, Mom said, standing her ground. His expression softened a bit. Please, I don't have much time, and this isn't my blood. Stormy moved to open the door. Mom and Stryker followed her inside. Once the door was closed, Mom turned on him. Damn it, Stryker. Tell me what's going on. Why are you covered in blood? Stryker looked over at Stormy, then back to Mom. How much does she know? Mom sighed. About what I've been looking into? Yes, Grim, he said. Everything. He seemed to sag a little. Everything as in everything about my family, or just what we've been looking into with the children. Stormy was the one to answer. I know there's some secret in your family, Stryker, but that's all I know. Grimm's told me what she's been working on, but she told me that she can't tell me about your family. Okay, that I can work with. 
he said, sounding slightly relieved, then took in a deep breath. Grim, my father's dead. Mom gasped. What happened? I don't have time to explain. All I can say is that we had a fight. No, you can't just tell me you had a fight and your dad's dead. What did you do? Mom asked. We had a fight about you. He attacked me, killed my mom, then tried to kill me. All I was doing was protecting myself. Now, Enclave's soldiers are looking for me. I only came here because I left, because I need to make sure that whatever you do, don't tell them anything about what we were talking about. Don't tell them about my hideout or anything, he said, starting to pace around the room. I don't understand. Why don't you just tell them what happened? Mom asked. They won't understand. There's already reports going around all of Nimbus about me killing both my parents. My father was a well-respected member of the military. He was about to start running for council. Then stay and explain what happened, Mom said, her voice sounding upset. I can't, Stryker said. I have to find the projects my father was hiding and destroy them. I can't let the Enclave take me in. If I do, they'll find out what I know, and they can't. They just can't. Mom moved closer to him, reaching out to pull him to her. Stryker, calm down. You're not making any sense. He backed away before she could touch him. Don't. Stormy said, Stryker, we can help you. I could feel Mom's chest go tight as she said, Stryker, let me help you. I didn't come here for help, Grim. I came here to make sure you keep your muzzle shut, he yelled. Don't talk that way to her, Stryker, Stormy said. Shut up, Dyke, I'm not talking to you. Stryker, Mom said as Stormy's eyes went big. I'm leaving, Grim. It's over between us, he said, moving towards the door. Wait, what? Stryker, where are you going? Mom asked, but she didn't move from Stormy's side. He took one last look at the both of them. I can't tell you where I'm going. I... I thought that you loved me, she said, her voice sounding broken and empty. His eyes narrowed. Loved you. I liked you, yes, but love? No, Grim. You were just a fun piece of ass. Something exciting to keep my mind off the shit going on around me. Find some other stallion who cares about your fucked up family drama. Or better yet, go cry to your brother because that's the only thing you're good at. Like I said, I only came here to tell you to keep your muzzle shut about my hideout. If I find out you said anything to the Enclave, I'll find you. And trust me, you don't want to know what I'll do to you. Fuck you, Stryker! Stormy yelled, her horn glowing. Before she could even cast a spell or say anything else, he was gone. The door slamming behind him leaving my mom to look at the door, tears starting to flow freely from her face. Stormy running back to mom and pulled her into a tight hug as mom broke down and the memory faded. The next one started in a room I remembered well, the hideout Stryker had in Nimbus. Mom felt tired from his memory, like she had spent all night crying. Sitting on the desk was a small note. She sniffed and walked over to the desk picked up the note, reading it quickly. Nightshade. I wish I had time to see you before I left, but I couldn't risk you being pulled into this. I've left everything you'll need to take over as the new guardian. I know Dad will never tell you or told you much about this work and my own since I've taken over the job, but we can't risk too many ponies knowing about our family's dark past or the truth behind everything we've done or hidden from the Enclave. On my terminal, you'll find the location of a power source to a project that can destroy what's left of Equestria. Go there and use the codes I left in your room to set up a new passcode. Don't let any pony follow you, and make sure you wear the outfit. It's the only way to get into the base where it's hidden under. You'll understand more when you go through the box of intel I've left here in my hideout. I know we've had our differences over the years, but I'm trusting you to carry out my mission. Our family's mission. Also, please look in on Grim when you can. I'm not sure what I'm going to say to her yet, but I'm sure she's going to be broken-hearted. I can't fix what happened, but 
but at least I can try and fix what our family did. I'll miss you, brother. Stryker. Mom set the note down gently, then turned towards the terminal, then said quietly, I hate you. Her horn started to glow, then she blasted the terminal. I hate you! She turned towards the boxes filled with files and blasted those to ash. Asshole! She threw the table against the wall. Why? Why couldn't you just tell me? She turned towards the cot, where I could see the outfit my father now wore as the stranger. Mom's horn glowed again, then she let the spell fade before she started to cry. Why'd you leave me? I would have gone with you. For a long time, Mom just sat there, letting her tears fall as she pressed her face into the soft fabric of the trench coat. Then she finally got back to her hooves. If this is what you wanted, then fine. I'm not going to let you bring me down, Stryker. I'm going to find something to make my life better, because I don't need you. Be but I will find out what you knew. I don't give two shits what you wanted your brother to have. Fuck your family and its secrets. Then Mom packed up as many papers as she could that hadn't been destroyed in her rage. She then fixed the table and placed Stryker's note back on the desk, then looked at the outfit one more time, then left. The memory faded, and the next thing I knew, another memory started, with Mom just waking up in her room, stormily cuddling up next to her. Whoa, don't tell me Mom did something with a mare I killed in Winnapolis. And please don't tell me she's going to show me a memory of her doing something. It was bad enough having to be in her body when she was making out with Stryker. I got my answer quickly because some pony knocked on the door, in what's seeming to wake her. Rubbing her eyes... She slowly pulled Stormy's hoof off her chest and got out of bed, and slowly made her way to the door. The knocking continued, and this time louder. Mom yawned, then muttered, I'm coming, hold on a damn minute. She opened the door, and standing there was my dad. His bright green eyes seemed to glow as he smiled slightly. His face looked a lot better without the scars around his muzzle and neck. He still had that silver stripe down the middle of his blue mane. Good morning, Grimoire. I'm sorry to bother you so early. I was sent by Nimbus. Come away, Mom said, moving to shut the door. Dad put a hoof on the door. I'm sorry, but I can't, Grimoire. This is about Stryker. Let me guess, you need to know where he's at? Well, I don't know anything. Go away. I can't. Not until we talk. If I leave, Nimbus will just send another pony your way, and you really don't want them to do that. Dad said, moving a little closer and saying quieter. I already know where he is, Grim. But I have to make this look official. Please. Just give me a few minutes, and then I'll leave. Stormy's voice echoed out of Mom's bedroom. Grim, where'd you go? Dad looked towards the bedroom and then said, I hope I didn't interrupt anything. Mom looked at him confused, then chuckled a little. No, it's not what you think. Stormy's just been comforting me after... Your brother said what he did after he left. Stormy showed up in the doorway, looking at Dad a moment, and then yawning. Hey, Nightshade. Haven't seen you in a while. Good morning, Stormy. I'm sorry to bother you swirly. He said, giving her a small bow. Stormy chuckled a little. Hmm. You become more polite in maturity. Dad chuckled a little. Military life can do that to you. Anyway, as I was saying, I'm here to talk about Stryker. Mom just yawned again. I hope you find him and cut his head off. That's all I have to say about him. I agree, Stormy said. I'm going to take a shower, Grim. As she walked back into the room, Dad asked, And so you two aren't, you know. Mom rolled her eyes. No, get your head out of the gutter, Nightshade. She's my best friend, for one, and I'm not into mares. She is. Respect her life choices. Anyway, why do you care if we're intimate? I don't. I was just curious. 
Dad was blushing. Gross. I don't need to know this. Mom just sighed. I'm really not in the mood to deal with you right now. So please, get to the point so I can kick you out and get back to sleep. It's my day off, and I really don't get to sleep in often. Dad cleared his throats. <clears throat> my apologies, Grimoire. I only came because I had to. What I really wanted to do was make sure that you aren't going to tell the Enclave about our families. Mom interrupted him. First of all, call me Grim. Second, I don't care about your family's crap. I already told Stryker I'd keep what he told me to myself and leave it at that. So unless you think I know where he is, which I don't, then you may leave. That's all I needed to know. Dad said, turning to leave. But then he stopped and asked, Are you going to be okay, Grim? I knew how close you two were. I could feel tears building up in Mom's eyes as she said, No, I'm not fine. Do you have any idea what it's like to come home after a nice day to find your special sun pony standing at your door, covered in blood? Then to have him tell you he killed his father, and he calls your best friend a dyke, and then tells you he never loved you? Dad's eyes fell a little as he turned back to my mom. No, I don't. I've never been close to any pony apart from Stryker, but I do understand loss. I was the one who found my parents. I... I didn't know. Mom said, lowering her gaze. Dad just shrugged. Stryker killing my father doesn't bother me. He was a horrible father and a mean son of a bitch. But Mom... She was good. She was kind. She didn't deserve to be shot down in her own son. For that, I can never forgive Stryker. He... He didn't kill your mother. He told me that much when he came here. He said that your father did it when she got between them fighting. Are you sure? Dad asked. Mom nodded. Yeah. One thing I know for sure is that Stryker wouldn't have even hurt your mother. I know her quite well, and she loved both of you quite a lot. He smiled a little, probably taking some comfort knowing his brother wasn't a cold-blooded killer. Well, I won't keep you. Sorry to barge in here so early again. If you ever need anything, just let me know. I know we didn't get along very well when we were younger, but I'm not that same cold. I know. Goodbye, Sergeant Nightshade, Mom said as he turned to leave. Before he could leave, she said, And I'm sorry about your mom. He turned towards her, his who from the doorknob. I'm sorry my brother broke your heart. Me too. I know you'll probably say no to this, but would you like to get a drink sometime? He asked. She sighed. I'm not really in the mood to go on a date with any pony right now, Nightshade. Especially with the brother of the stallion who just broke my heart. He smiled a little. I wasn't asking you on a date, Grim. I'm just trying to help a nice mare get her mind off things for a while. You can bring Stormy too, if that makes you feel better. At least think about it. We'll see, Mom said. Okay. Good day, Grim, Dad said as he walked out of the door. For a long moment, Mom just looked at the door, then she ran towards it, threw it open, then yelled down the hall, Tomorrow night? Say around eight? Dad was almost at the stairs. He turned and laughed. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll see you then. Mom went back into her apartment, smiling a little. She walked back into her room right as Stormy was coming out of the bathroom, a towel wrapped around her mane. I think that's the first time I've seen a true smile on your face in a week. Are you free tomorrow? Mom asked, ignoring what Stormy said. She shrugged. Nightmare in 208 wanted to take me out to a drink tomorrow. Why? Oh, well, Nightshade wanted us to get a drink. Not as a date, just to make me feel better. I wanted you to come too, but if you have a date, I can go alone. Stormy walked over to Mom and laughed as she hugged her. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I can tell her to take a hike for my BFF. Are you sure? She isn't that good looking anyway. 
She also has a pole way up her flanks. Mom just laughed, hugging her friend back. You're the best. Man, don't you forget it, Stormy said, pushing Mom back into her bed. Now, get some rest. You still need some sleep. Mom's smile faded again. I'm not sure I can. Stormy took the towel off her mane, then laid down with Mom, and cuddled up next to her again, letting her wet mane fall onto Mom's chest. That's what you have me for. Mom slowly ran a hoof over the wet mane of her friend. Stormy, I hope you don't think by letting you sleep in my bed means anything more than... I know, Stormy interrupted. I may love you more than you do me, but I know your limits. I'm not expecting anything. I just want you to feel better and to help keep your mind off that asshole. I just want to be here for you. If something more important, or more than this happens, then it'll be all your choice. Not mine. Mom just smiled again. It won't go past this, Stormy. The memory started to fade as Mom started to close her eyes, and I heard Stormy say, Don't say things that you can't live up to, Grim. The next memory was Mom looking up at a beautiful night sky. In the distance, Pegasi were putting on some kind of show. Ponies were all lying around in small groups watching the marvel of aerial acrobatics. As Mom watched the sky, I noticed she was laying her head on some pony's chest, a foreleg wrapped around her, keeping her close. I'm glad you came out with me tonight, Grim, I heard my dad saying. Mom was smiling as she cuddled up closer to him. You know I wouldn't miss a chance to spend time with you, Nightshade. He laughed. A year ago, you were more than happy to kick me out of your apartment. I'm not a morning pony, Nightshade. I thought you'd know that by now, she said. No, I wouldn't. I think Stormy would know more about your sleeping habits than I would. I guess you're right. Don't tell me you're still jealous, Mom teased. Well, you do spend most of your nights sleeping with a mare who has a big crush on you. Yeah, but she knows not to go there. She just makes me feel better. Dad looked down at her and rubbed her mane. I thought that was my job. It is, but you don't share my bed. I don't sleep well. If I remember right, you said you wanted to wait. He laughed. I do. So why don't you sleep well? I thought you were over, my brother. She sighed. I am. Trust me, I am. He's not the reason I can't sleep. I keep having bad dreams. I think it has to do with the zebra magic mixing with my own. The dreams I have are too real. It's like I'm seeing things that's going to happen in the future. But I've never had that kind of power. What kinds of things are you seeing in these dreams? Mom nuzzled closer. A few things. But they are all scattered. Segmented. I keep seeing a filly vanishing in a blast of light. Or a mare in the wasteland trying to stop me from killing her. She keeps begging me to remember her, but I don't know who she is. I keep seeing a darkness taking over that same mare. Magic coming out of her that I have never seen or heard of in Equus. Sounds like a bad nightmare, he said. It is, but when I have some pony I care about with me, the dreams go away. That's why I let Stormy sleep in my bed, even though I know it's hard on her. I know she likes me, but I just need her close. I understand, and I'm not jealous. Stormy is a good friend, he said. She is. For a long time, they just watched the show. Until it finally ended, Pegasi sighed and started leaving. When most of the ponies were gone, Dad said, Grim. Mom looked up at him. Yeah. Dad moved his head closer and kissed her for a long moment, his tongue pushing into her muzzle. Mom making a moaning noise as he did. Ah-ha! Why do you keep showing me this crap, Mom? Thank the goddesses it didn't last too long, because Dad pulled away and looked down into Mom's eyes. I love you, Grim. I could feel tears in Mom's eyes as she said quietly, I was hoping you were going to say that soon. I love you too. Marry me? He asked. Mom jumped and looked confused at him. 
marry you? I love you, Grim, and I want to be the pony that makes you feel safe at night. I want to be there for you no matter what. He spoke a few more hopeless romantic quips, which seemed to work on Mom. I could feel Mom blush as she chuckled. You have such a way with words, Nightshade. I'm serious, Grim, he said. Mom moved closer to him and kissed him again. Stop it! Then said, Nightshade, if you can promise that you'll always be a good stallion to me, and a good father if we are lucky to enough to become parents, then I'd be more than happy to spend the rest of my life with you. The memory faded with my dad smiling like a fool. I was a little touched by the memory, even with mom kissing dad. You. I mean, it's one thing to see your parents kiss. It's no big deal. But being in mom's body while she's kissing my dad? No. Thank you. The next memory started with mom in a doctor's office. It must have been some years later because dad looked a little older now. He was holding mom's hoof as she slowly cried as she, the doctor spoke. I'm sorry, Miss Spell, but there isn't anything we could have done to save the foal. He just wasn't strong enough to make it full term. This is the second foal I've lost, Doc. What's wrong with me? Mom asked through her tears. We've ran some tests, but all we can tell is that something's making your body reject the foals. Dad asked. What do you think could have caused this? Grimm's always been a healthy mare. The doctor looked like his answer was painful as he said slowly. Well, we've seen this before. In unicorns who have a lot of magical power like you do, Miss Bell. Magic can do a lot of wonderful things, but it does come at a price. The energy it costs can damage your body. Most of the time with mares, it makes having foals next to impossible. No, there has to be a way I can fix this, Mom said. I'm sorry, but I don't think that there's anything that can be done. There's a very small chance, but it's very unlikely. Mom turned and held on to Dad as she started to cry. I want you to be a mother so badly. I know, hon. I know, Dad said, rubbing Mom's mane. As Mom cried into Dad's shoulder, the doctor said, It may be too soon for this. But if you'd like, I can give you some information on adoption. We always have more fillies and colts who need a good home. Mom looked at the doctor. I don't want some pony else's colt. I want my own. Then she got up and started to walk towards the door. As she did, I could hear Dad say, I'm sorry. I'll talk to her, and I'll take the information you have on adoption. I think she just needs a little more time to process this. Mom kept walking down the hall, doing her best to wipe away her tears. As the memory faded, and before I could start to wonder if Mom was trying to tell me I was adopted after all, the next memory started to fade. Sitting on a couch in a little house, I had vague memories of from when I was little. There were a few mares around her, and Mom's belly was huge. Sitting next to her was Stormy, a pegasus mare cuddled up next to the small unicorn. Mom was smiling wide as she said, Thank you all for the wonderful gifts. Nightshade and I are thankful for all your amazing support. A mare near the back said, Grim, what are you thinking about for names? Do you even know if it's a filly or a colt? Nightshade and I are going to wait until it's time to have the foal. We want to be surprised. But we're going to go and do what's tradition in my family. Name the foal as he or she ages. Mom said happily. Stormy chuckled. I hope that she's a filly. At least she'll be good-looking like her mother. The mares in the room chuckled, as did a stallion that came into the room. It was my uncle. He smiled, saying happily, I heard a very special mare was being thrown a full shower today. Ori, Mom said happily. I thought you couldn't make it. My commander let me off early when I told him I had someplace more important to be. Orichalus said as he walked past the mares and a gift floating in his magic. I noticed as he walked some of the mares blushed. One even batted her eyes at my uncle as he passed by. Uncle Ori walked up to Mom and set the gift down in front of her, then took a seat next to Mom. 
opposite of Stormy. Mom smiled and hugged him. So, big brother, what did you get me? Open it up and you'll see, he said with a chuckle and then looked past Mom and said, Hey, Stormy, who's the arm candy? Stormy looked down at the other mare, who was still nestling up to her. Um, something lights? The mare looked up at Stormy, saying with an offended tone, It's fairy lights. As the mares around the room chuckled, Stormy just shrugged. Hey, at least I got half your name right. The mare huffed. You don't have to be so rude. We've been seeing each other for almost a week now. Really? I just kept calling you cute Pegasus in my head. Her jaw dropped open. I don't need to be treated this way. I'm leaving. She got up and walked away in a huff. Stormy watched her go, a slight smile on her face. I personally still like cute Pegasus Mare, because she does have the cutest ass. Mom just sighed as Callus chuckled next to her. I don't really know why you have to be that way with every mare you meet. Stormy just chuckled. Not all of us are lucky enough to find a special sun pony as wonderful as yours, Grim. One of the other mares giggled. Stormy, are you ever going to settle down? Doubt it. Life is way more fun this way, Stormy said as she looked over at Grim. Enough talk about my lack of love life. Open the gift. Mom just sighed, then giggled too. Okay. She pulled the top off the box, but I didn't get to see what was inside because the memory ended there. The next one started with Mom looking down at a newborn foal. Me, who she was holding close as Dad sat next to her on the hospital bed. Mom ran a hoof over the white filly's face. She's perfect, Nightshade. She really is. So, have you thought of what to call her? Star. It's a family name, passed down ever since my great-great-great-grandfather, Dwarf Star. I like it. But I thought that you hated your family, Dad said. No, I hate my parents. But my family isn't that bad. And you know, I'm very close with Lord Callus. Star was his name before he changed it. My mom was Fallen Star, her mother was Bright Star, then Neon Star, and so on. I'd like to keep that tradition going, unless you want to use something from your own family name. Dad laughed. <laughs> no, she doesn't look like a mare who'd fit my family that well, and that's just fine with me. Star it is, then. My miracle filly. My little star. So the doctor said she's okay, right? Nothing wrong with her at all, Dad said as he ran a hoof over my short black mane. She's perfect, Nightshade. Why would you think otherwise? Dad just moved closer to Mom, saying, She just seems small, even for a newborn. Oh, don't worry about that. My mother was a short mare, same for my great-grandfather. Honest Leori and I are lucky we are of average height, Mom said, moving her head down to kiss my horn. As she did, sparks of red came from it. Mom and Dad both jumped. Ah, oh, did you see that nightshade? Before he could answer, the foal, myself, started to whimper. As I did, my little horn started to glow red and small objects started to float into the air. As they did, Dad asked, Honey, are you seeing this too? I am, Mom said. Then she used her own magic to push the items back down. I've never seen a foal so young use magic like that before. Is that a bad thing? Dad asked, sounding concerned all over again. Mom rocked me a little as she said, No, I think it's a good thing. The memory ended there with Mom starting to sing to me quietly, only to be replaced with a memory I feared was coming. Mom seemed to be working with a doctor or pony saying, I've used that new spell we've created, and I think the colt is looking a lot better. I'm glad to hear that, Grim. How can I ever thank you enough for all the help you and your team have done here? You've saved a lot of lives with those new spells of yours that you've been able to come up with. Mom smiled. It's one reason I wanted to work for the research department. I wanted to help as many fillies and colts as I could. 
Mom was cut off by my father, screaming down the hall, Graham! Mom's head snapped around to see father flying down the hall of the hospital, his power armor on and a small white filly held close to him. Mom saw my limp form and ran over to him as he landed, the doctor not far behind. Nightshade, what happened to Star? Dad was holding me close with one hoof as he said, I'm not sure. All I know is that Oricalus did something. An explosion of black light filled his lab and I found Star almost dead in the middle of the blast zone. She's barely breathing. The doctor started yelling. We need a stretcher in here. Stat, get every pony we can to room 208. We have an injured filly. The stretcher was there in an instant. Three nurses with it. One moved uh, to Dad and took my limp form with him, saying, Give it to me, sir. Don't worry, we'll take it from here. They started to rush off with my small body as the doctor said quickly, Nightshade, right? I need to know exactly what happened. I don't know. I just headed over to Oricalis' lab to pick up Star when I saw a ball of blackness slam into her. I thought she was dead. Everything around her was destroyed. Then I saw him run over to her and checked her for any sign of life. Do you know if her heart stopped? The doctor asked. I'm not sure. Dad said, sounding worried. Mom just looked at them both, her own heart racing. Then the doctor looked at her. And do you know what kind of magic your brother could have been using? I have no idea. He's been experimenting with something old, but I never thought he'd use it around my daughter. Grim, I'll do whatever I can to help your daughter. I need you to find Ori Callis and ask him what happened. It may be the only thing that can save her. Mom rounded on Dad. Tell me exactly what happened. I just did. Was the blackness a spell you've seen me use before? I could see the light in my father's eyes go dark as he answered, No. I've never seen anything like it. It was like your brother made something powerful and contained it into a ball of black energy. I only saw it for a moment as it was flying that star. But when I did, I swear I could feel something evil from it. Before Mom could say anything else, Oricalus appeared in the hall. He had a black eye where Dad had hit him. His mane was disheveled, and his purple eyes were wide. Where is she? Dad rounded on him. You have a lot of balls showing your face here, Oricalus. Mom stepped in between the two. Not now, Nightshade. I need to know what happened. She turned towards her brother. We can talk about how stupid you are for doing dark magic around my daughter, but right now... I need to do anything I can to save my daughter's life. What did you do? My uncle was panting and tears started to run down his face. I was trying to finish my project. A new way to power the city using dark magic. It's a spell I found in Sombra's journal. It's how he powered the city when he ruled over it. He used dark crystal magic. I can't, so I worked backwards. I don't need the details. Tell me what the spell was. Mom yelled. Ignoring the other ponies in the hall. Shadow magic. My uncle said. I could feel a chill run down Mom's body as she said. Shadow magic can't be done. Its creator and all the power he had was banished to Tartarus. It's possible if you know what to do. You'd have to open the door to Tartarus itself and only goddesses could do that. Normally, yes. But I found a back door. An ancient door. That can be opened anywhere. It takes a lot of skill, but I was able to do it. And pull a little out of the shadow magic. Dad pushed past Mom and got in his face. And you thought it'd be a good idea to use it on my daughter? My uncle's horn flashed. A moment later, Dad was thrown back and pinned to the floor as my uncle yelled. I didn't use it on her. I'm not sure what happened, but she somehow used her own magic and overturned her crib. I turned to help her because she was crying. As soon as my magic touched hers, the shadow magic escaped my hold and followed the lines of magic I had wrapped around her, and it flew towards her. I tried to stop it, but shadow magic isn't like any other in our world. It tried to kill her because something about Star's magic spooked it. She would have died, too, if I hadn't used another spell the last second to destroy a good chunk of the spell. Let him go, Ori, Mom said, her own horn glowing. No, not until both of you understand that I didn't mean to hurt her. 
A magic circle appeared next to my uncle, and Mom said in a scary, low voice, Let my husband go, Ori. Ori Callis backed up a step, letting his magic fade as he said in a pitiful voice, I didn't mean to hurt her. I'd never let anything bad happen to her. Mom sighed, letting her own magic fade as she said, I know, but you still let her get hurt, Ori. You better go back to your lab and find a way to fix this. And with that, Mom started heading down the hall. I could hear my dad getting back to his hooves, saying, If my daughter dies, Oricalus, I'll kill you myself. The memory shifted, and now Mom was sitting in a hospital room next to Dad, both of them looking down at a white foal hooked up to wires, a tube going down her throat, IV lines poked into her, both of my four legs, and a small stuffed bird lying next to my head. The same doctor as before was speaking softly as Mom ran her hoof over my young mane. We've done everything we can, but the spell used on her won't subside. It's slowly starving her heart. In a day, maybe less, her brain won't be able to get enough oxygen and she'll be gone. I wish I had better news, but we don't. Tears were running down both my parents' faces as Mom said, I'm not losing her. The doctor's face looked sad as he replied, I know you're a gifted unicorn, Grim, but nothing can be done to fix the damage that was done. There's a blackness surrounding your heart, and the magic itself is nothing we've seen before. Even your brother couldn't make the power go away. He tried everything he knew, but still, she's going to die. Mom slowly lifted her head, glaring at the doctor. I said, I'm not going to lose her. If you can't fix what was done to her, and neither can my brother, then I will. Mom got to her hooves, leaned down, and kissed the tip of my horn, while whispering, Don't worry, my little star. I'll find a way. Just be strong and hold on as long as you can. With that, she walked out of the room, Dad not far behind. Grim, wait. Mom didn't stop. She pushed past a nurse, saying, I don't have time, Nightshade. I know there's a way to fix her. I just know it. Dad flew in front of her, blocking her path. At least talk to me before you storm out of here. Mom's horn started to glow. Get out of my way, Nightshade. Dad didn't move. Instead, he yelled. Do you think the only person who cared about her is you? Do you think that it doesn't break my heart to see our daughter suffering like she is? Mom's horn stopped glowing as fresh tears fell down her face. I didn't say that. Then talk to me. Tell me what you're planning. I just want to make sure that I'm not going to lose both of the mares that I care about. Put a little faith in me, Grim. Dad said, moving forward, bending down and pulling her into a tight hug. I just want to know what you're going to do. Tell me and I'll support you. Mom buried her face into Dad's shoulder. I'm going to that library I told you about. The hidden one. I know there's a book there that might fix Star. Or at least keep her healthy until I can find a way to help. Dad pulled away and locked his dazzling green eyes on Mom's gray ones. Good. You do what you have to. In the meantime, I'll take care of things here. Mom pulled away quietly. Are you going after him? I don't have to. The higher-ups already know what he did. You'll know what they'll do to him for this, Dad said, turning towards the hospital room. Mom took a minute to watch him go as she teleported. In a flash of blue, Mom was standing in front of the entrance to the Crystal Palace. She took a deep breath and started up the steps. One of the guards looked over at her, saying, Good morning, Grim. Sorry to hear about your little one. I hope that she'll pull through. Mom looked at the Pegasus guard, nodding her head a little. Me too, Blazewing. And what brings you to the castle today? The guard asked. Just a little research. I'm working on a project, and I wanted to look into more history behind the wall and how it was created. I just need to get my mind off of Star being in the hospital. The other guard snickered a little. Every pony knows how the wall was made. 
Princess Cadence and Prince Shining Armor combined their power and gave their lives to make the wall and keep the poison out of the city. Are you a researcher in Nimbus? Did you do all the research into the way the magic was formed or how it was channeled through the city to form the wall? Or did you read up and look how the wall was still powered even through the rulers are dead now? Mom asked, though she didn't have the normal smug tone. The other guard stuttered a little. Well, no, but everybody knows the story. Blazewing rolled his eyes. Shut up. Grim's always allowed inside. Then he turned back to Mom. Go on inside, Grim. I'll stop by the hospital later, if that's okay with you. Mom smiled a little. I could tell it was forced. Thank you, Blazewing. It means a lot to me. Mom walked past and into the castle. She ignored the other ponies walking around and headed straight to the hall she'd walked down when she was just a filly. As she approached the statue, she spoke the phrase that she had said as a child. The statue's eyes lit up and moved and out of the way. Mom stepped up onto the pedestal and walked through the door. When she was in the Forgotten Library, she used her magic to start pulling books from the shelves. She started moving them towards the table where she'd found the bones before, which was now cleared off. When she was done forming a pile of books on the table, she took a deep breath, sat down, and started reading. There has to be something here. There must be. The memory shifted again, and Mom was still sitting at the table. I could feel her mane was disheveled. Books were stacked all over, and her eyes hurt. She swore. Using her magic, she tossed the book across the room. Damn it! The book slammed into a bookshelf, knocking a few more off. Mom looked over where the books fell, then narrowed her eyes. What is that? She asked as she got to her hooves and went over to the shelf. The book was stuck behind the others. It had a light blue cover with words written in gold. She pulled the book out and read the cover. Pure magic of light. The author's name was so worn that it couldn't be read. Light magic? I thought there weren't any books left around. Light magic anymore? Mom said as she went back to the table, opening the book. She started flipping through the pages, scanning the spells written in fading magic. Then she stopped on a title page. The spell of Purity. Under that, it said, the spell can banish away most dark magic. Mom started to laugh and cry at the same time as she started to read the spell. This is where I got lost. I could understand the basics of spells and how they were laid out in a spell book, and that was about it. Mom was the one who could read a spell and understand its structure. I needed to see how a spell was done normally or practice it over and over again. After reading it once, Mom smiled again, then started to draw on her magic. On the table, a bright light showed up, glowing like a little star. I think I got it, Mom said, getting back to her hooves and stuffing the book into her bag. She started to run, back out of the forgotten library, down the hall, and back to the castle, ignoring the guards who tried to say something to her as she ran past. Once she was off the steps, she teleported, reappearing at the hospital. She ran again, knocking over two nurses and a doctor, as she did. She blasted through the door, making Dad jump off his seat, the doctor from before tripping over his hooves, saying, Grim, you have scared us half to death. Dad looked at Mom. Grim, are you okay? I think I can fix it, Mom said, moving over to the bed. How's she doing? Grim, what do you mean you can fix it? The doctor said. How is she? Mom asked again, ignoring his question. She doesn't have long, but I don't understand, he said. Move, Mom said, pushing the doctor aside. Dad got back up, asking... Grim, are you sure? She looked over at him. I'm not sure of anything anymore, Nightshade. But what choice do we have? Grim, I can't have you trying out spells on your daughter. She's sick enough as it is. Don't make her suffer more than she already has. The doctor said. Mom frowned, then looked back at him. I'm not letting any pony stop me from saving her. Now back off, or I'll make you back off. He backed up as Mom started to draw on her magic. A blue light surrounding my little body. Then Mom's vision seemed to flicker. My body seemed to fade, showing Mom my beating heart. Around it was a blackness. Mom's magic moved down and surrounded the blackness. 
It started to pulse as Mom's magic touched it, followed by a flash of light. The darkness seemed to fade and then vanish. As soon as it was gone, my heart seemed to look better, and it started beating faster. Mom let the magic fade right as my full self started to cry. The heart monitors started to beep normally as the doctor said, I can't believe it. Dad and Mom both started to cry as they both moved to hug my small crying body. Dad saying, Grim, you're a miracle worker. Another memory started with Dad and Mom sitting in our small living room. I was sleeping on Mom's lap, looking a little older than I had in the last memory. Dad was watching as Mom used the same spell to push away the darkness again. I thought that spell was supposed to cure her. Mom sighed. I thought so too, but the darkness keeps coming back. I've looked through all the books about dark magic, and I can't find any more on the Book of Light Magic. Some of the pages were lost to time or faded too much to read. With what I've gathered, nothing's even close to this spell. Is she ever going to be better? Dad asked with a sigh. I don't know, but at least she'll be able to live a somewhat normal life. Mom said as she finished her spell and ran a hoof over my black mane as I slept. Dad seemed to want to change the subject because he asked, Did you hear what happened last week? With your brother? Mom nodded. And they tried eight different ways to kill him, but it didn't work. Everything they tried just made him turn into a shadow. I've never seen anything like it before. Mom sighed. What are they going to do with him then? I'm not sure. There's talk about banishing him or using him to make some kind of a special ops team. Most of the intel's hush. But I've been hearing things, Dad said. I'm sure whatever they offer him, he'll do what they ask. He's loyal to the Enclave. Always has been. His power. Do you know what it is? Dad asked. Mom took a long time to answer. She kept running her hooves over my mane as I slept, as if she was deep in thought. Finally, she said, I have an idea. But that's all it is. An idea. All I know is that he said no matter what, he'd help me find a way of fixing Star. Dad cursed. I don't want him anywhere near her. Mom looked up at him. He loves her as much as you do, Nightshade. He didn't try to hurt her, and he's doing everything he can to help. Dad got to his hooves, slowly. I know. He moved towards the door that led into a hall. But for all I care, he can go to hell. That's the only help I want from him. Mom just sighed. Are you heading out? Dad nodded. I have to check on things at the base. How long this time? A couple of weeks, maybe longer. We've gotten word that a fight broke out between some new settlement and the base ponies. I need to make sure everything's secure. Also, I've been hearing about Steel Rangers moving their power up that way. Dad said. Just be safe, and come home as soon as you can. Mom said as the memory faded. The next memory had to be a couple years later. I was a filly playing hide-and-seek with our dad in the living room. Mom was just walking by when she saw me hiding under the couch. Star, what are you doing? Shh, Mommy, I'm hiding from Daddy. I said, trying to hide further back under the couch. Huh, okay. I won't tell him where you are. Mom said with a chuckle as she walked past the living room and Dad, who was checking the cabinets for me. She went over to her room, then to her closet. Pushing some of her outfits aside, she pushed on the wall. But it wasn't a wall. It was a hidden door that opened to steps that led down to a small cellar. Mom closed the door behind her and walked down to it. It was a small lab. Test tubes were all over the place, along with books and notes scattered around. Then, in one corner was a terminal and a few more notes, along with a statuette of twilight. Mom sat at the desk and logged into the terminal. She started looking through her notes on different kinds of magic, when a beep came from the terminal. As if she was expecting it, she backed out of the file she was reading and answered the call that was coming through a secure broadcast channel. I told you before to leave me alone. A mayor's voice came out of Mom's terminal. And I keep telling you that I can help you with your foal's problem. 
My daughter is fine. I don't know who you are or what you want from me, but I'm not going to trust some random mare from outside the Enclave. I have a spell to keep my daughter alive. I don't need your help. Let me ask you this, Grimoire. Is the spell getting harder for you to perform? Is Star showing any improvements at all, or is her illness getting worse? The mayor on the terminal asked. It's none of your business. Now stop contacting me, or I'll inform Enclave Security that some Wasteland mayor is hacking into our systems. Mom said. A light chuckle came through the terminal. Grimoire, even if you did tell the Enclave about me, it wouldn't do you any dead good. I'm not trying to scam you or use you in any way. I'm trying to help you. If the intel I got about Star is correct, then she won't last forever with that spell. All it's doing is holding back the inevitable. Sooner or later, you'll have to watch as she dies a painful death. I could feel Mom's heart start to beat faster. Even if you are telling me the truth, then why would you care about my family? I care because I hate the thought of any young foal dying. It has nothing to do with you or your family. Well, not entirely. Your husband does interest me a little, or how I should say his alter ego does, the mayor said. Mom's muzzle opened a little as she said, How do you know about that? The ponies I work with are very good at digging up secrets. Secrets like a family that spent decades trying to hide what's under Spitfire's flight academy. Secrets about a secret group of ponies during the Great War who made something powerful. Powerful enough to cure your filly. The mayor said. Mom's eyes went wide as her heart was racing now. I've looked through every book I can find about the kind of magic that hurt her and nothing shows a cure. The closest thing I found is a spell that I use now that holds back her sickness. <laughs> That's because you're missing a few key things that's wrong with her and what Manette was working on with Nightstalker and the children. What do you know about Nightstalker or my family's past? Also, what does it have to do with curing my daughter? Nothing in the intel about the children says anything about them making any kind of project that can cure ponies. The Ministry of Peace did, but they never had anything that can destroy darkness. Mom said, her voice going quiet. I don't believe you. The reason you can't find anything is because the project wasn't made to cure. It was made to be a weapon. How can a weapon help my daughter? Mom asked. There was a pause, and the mayor said, It's hard to explain it all, but to put it simply, a key part of this project has the potential to be turned into a weapon, into a cure. If that's true, then tell me how to do this and where to find it, Mom said. That's the problem. I don't know where the project is or this key. Then what use are you to me? Mom asked. Easy, Grimoire. I didn't say I didn't know anything. I just don't know where it's located. I do know two things that can help you find it, though. The first part is looking into the notes and information that are hidden under Spitfire's Flight Academy. The second will require that you obtain a Pippa. Mom almost laughed as she said, A Pippa? Should I just go to the closest stable and ask nicely for one? No, not just any old Pippa will do. This one is special, and it won't be easy to obtain. It's the key for making this project work and getting you into the basement of the Academy. Again, what do you get out of all of this? Mom asked. And don't feed me some bullshit about how you want to help. I want the truth. Fine, the mayor said. I want the project unlocked. Once you use the power it has to cure Star... I want the pip buck, all the information you found on the project, and how to use it. it. Sounds like you want this weapon for yourself. What do you plan on doing with it? Are you going to try and use it to take over the Enclave? The Wasteland? Mom asked. No, nothing like it at all. I want to use it to fix Equestria, and then I want to destroy the weapon. Sure you do. The mayor sighed. I'm not a bad pony, Grimoire. I'm trying to do something good. Then why me? Why my daughter? Mom asked. Because you're the only man that can help. You're smart, driven, and most importantly, powerful. At least think about it. I can help you. 
Mom sighed, and I felt a tear roll down her face. I'll think about it. But if I do this and I find out that you've lied to me in any way, I'll kill you. I understand. What is your name, by the way? Mom asked. That I can't tell you. Not until I know I can trust you in return. For now, call me the director. Then suddenly, the mayor cut off the connection. Mom sighed. Goddesses, what do I do? Another memory started. Mom was in the same room as before, talking with the mayor, calling herself the director. I've looked through all the notes I can find from Stryker, and I think I know where to start looking for intel on Falling Shadows. That is, if that's the project you're looking for. The director responded. And that's the only one it could be. The other projects they were looking on were documented. At least, here they were. And they can't be those ones. The only one that I know almost nothing about is Falling Shadows. What did Stryker know about it? Only that it was part of another project. But I don't have a name for it. All he says about it was that it's the key to starting Falling Shadows. He said something about there being a possible location for the project in New Pegasus. Mom said as he... She started looking through some notes she had on her desk. Are you sure this will help Star? If not, then I don't know what else can. The problem is that you'll have to go to New Pegasus. I can't leave Star here. If I did, she wouldn't survive, Mom said. And then you'll have to bring her with you. I don't know if that's a good idea. Also, if I leave the Enclave, they'll come after me. Grim, if you don't take the risk, you'll never save Star. The director said. I know. Mom said. Then Dad's voice echoed from upstairs. Grimoire, it's happening again! Mom said quickly to the director. I'll be back when I can. That being said, Mom teleported upstairs to find Dad holding me close. My body thrashing. Mom's horn started to glow, and like before, it was like she could see through my body in the blackness around my heart. She started to use the spell to push back the blackness, and as she did, she asked, What was she doing? She was jumping up and started talking about playing with her friends, and the attack hit her. Dad said, tears in her eyes, as my body started to calm. Was it worse than last week? She asked, looking down at me as she finished up the spell. Worse. Definitely worse. Grim, I don't know if she can take this much longer. He said, holding back sobs. I don't know what to do anymore. Mom sighed and slowly pulled me out of Dad's hooves and into her own, hugging my limp body. There might be a way, but you're not going to like it. If it'll save our daughter, then I don't care what you have to do, Grim. Dad said. Mom rubbed my mane slowly. I... I found something in the old files back at base. There could be a small chance of saving her, but I'll have to leave for, with her. It took a moment for Dad to answer. For how long? I'm not sure. It could take years. I have the spell to keep her going, and I think it can keep us at bay for as long enough. If I'm right, she should get better. Where do you have to go? He asked. I have to go to New Pegasus, to the old base outside the city where the bomber ponies live, to start. You can't do that. You of all ponies know what's under that base. I do. And it might be our only hope to save her, Mom said as she pulled me closer to her. Grim, our family's protected the secret of that project for 200 years. If you go there and start everything back up, you know what'll happen. I do. And it's worth it if I can save her. You said yourself that you'll do anything to keep her alive, remember? Mommy, my chest hurts. I know, sweetie. Just rest and everything will be okay. Mom said as she rubbed my mane. Dad stood and started to move away. Do what you have to. Just remember, if you go down this path, I'll have to hunt you down. That's the rules in our family. I know. And I love you. 
Dad turned back. And I love both of you, even more than my loyalty to my fellow Pegasi. Mom started to cry a little as she said, I'll need help getting out of the city. Dad sighed as he started to head towards their room. I'm not sure what I can do, but I'll figure something out. Start getting ready before I'm forced to change my mind. Mom watched him go, then using her magic, she picked me up and took me into her own room. She set me down in my bed and set Avon next to me. Now, sweetie, I want you to get some rest. Mommy has a few things to take care of. Okay, I said as I pulled the stuffed bird close to me. Mom kissed me, then headed back to her room where Dad was putting on his military uniform. Are we okay, Nightshade? I don't like this grim. Stryker didn't have very much information about the project. I don't even know what it does. How do you know it'll help? I was able to find more information on it. There's something down there that may help cure her, or at least lead me to what can. I promise that I won't mess with anything down there. I just need to get into the main chamber, Mom said. Dad sighed, then put on his battle saddle. I don't think you'll be able to do it. Mom smiled a little. Sweetie, have a little more faith in me. He walked over to her and kissed her for a moment. I've always had faith in you. I'm just scared that something's going to happen. I know, but we have to do this. Mom said, kissing him back. Now get to work. I'll see you tonight. Dad left without another word. When he was gone, Mom went back to her closet and opened the hidden door. She walked back to the steps and back to her terminal where the connection to the director was active. Mom sat, saying, Are you still there, director? I am. Is everything all right? No, not at all. You are right. Star's getting worse. I need to get out of here as soon as possible and head to New Pegasus. If there's even a small chance of helping her, I have to try. Mom said. Just so you know, Grim, if you do this, you may never be able to go back. The Enclave doesn't take well to their citizens leaving. Are you prepared to go through that? The director asked. Mom rested her head on the desk, taking in a few deep breaths, letting her heart rate slow before she responded quietly. What other choice do I have? She's my little filly, a miracle foal. I'm not going to lose her. Okay, then. I should be able to help you, but you'll have to be prepared. I have a friend that works for a Talon group in the New Pegasus area. He can help you get out of the Crystal Empire. You'll need to pack light. Just take what you need and nothing else. Bring the files you have, and make sure to find yourself a good weapon. I've never used a weapon. I've always relied on my magic, Mom said. Where you live, I'm sure that served you fine, but the wasteland is different need a reliable weapon. Something powerful that won't break easy. Get what you need and I'll have my friend ready to help you. It should take about a week or so. Why a week? Can't we leave sooner? Mom asked. No. It will take him about that long to get there. He's not as young as he used to be and there's other things he has to get ready before he leaves. I'll contact you when we're ready. Fine. I'll be ready. Mom said as the memory faded. The next memory started with Mom dressing me in a dark cloak with a hood. Okay, sweetie, I need you to be as quiet as you can. Where are we going? I asked, yawning. I'm sleepy. We're going on a trip. There's a place that might be able to help you, make you all better. Mom said as she finished dressing me. Like a hot spittle? I asked cutely. Mom chuckled a little, but a tear ran down her face. Not like the hospital. If we're lucky and have faith in the goddesses, we might be able to heal you. Dad walked into the room wearing his stranger outfit. That's right, sweetie. Just listen to your mother and you'll be okay. Okay, Daddy, I said. Why can't you come with us, Daddy? He moved down and kissed her head. I told you before. I have to make sure you and your mother get out of the city safely. I started to cry as Dad hugged me. I'm going to miss you, Daddy. <laughs> I 
I'll miss you too. But I'll see you again, sweetie. This isn't goodbye. It's, I'll see you later. Dad said. Mom moved forward. We need to go, Star. Then she looked at Dad. I love you, Nightshade. He kissed her for a long moment, then whispered, I love you too. Now, go. I'll buy as much time as I can. Remember that if you need anything, send me a message from the base. I felt Mom smile a little. I remember. I just have one stop to make on my way out. I know. Just be careful. Dad said, pulling on his mask and putting on his desperado hat. With that, he took one last look at both, his bright green eyes shining from under the hat, then he was gone. Mom took one last look around the house, then put her cloak on and her saddlebags. Then she picked me up with her magic, placed me on her back, and we too left. Mom never looked back. Loading next chain of memories. Please wait. 55% to level. Perk not found. Error. Error. Loading.